Guys, in this video, I wanted to take a moment to show you some steps in how to program an air handler using the Johnson Controls controller configuration tool, CCT as it's commonly known. Here you can see we have a new window open and we're ready to begin our programming. Now, one thing you're gonna notice is that there may be small differences between the versions that are out there. The current version that I am using is 10.1. There are minor differences in the different versions of CT, CCT that I wanted to tell you about. And uh, if you notice things that may not be in the exact same order as what I see here, that is potentially why. So you want to program your air handler. Uh, and so what do you do? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to go up to File. We need to select New. And once we do that, it's going to ask system name. We're just going to give this a generic name for now. Just call it AHU. And of course, this drop down window is key to part of what we do whenever we write a new program. Of course, air handling units is already selected for us. But this drop down window is uh, what we would use to select the particular device. So since we're going with an air handler, we go, we just leave it there. System configuration, it's going to be a mixed air single duct system, depending on what you have. If you have a makeup unit, you know, 100% outside air. Uh, mixed air dual duct system. I've got videos on the differences of some of those. I will try to leave a card about on to where you can uh, learn a little more about those. Rooftop units, multi-zone, that sort of thing. We're just going to go with mixed air single duct. The system of units currently here in the U.S. we're going to use Imperial. However, some of you guys may want to use metric just depending on your location and you simply press the OK button. Now what it's going to do here in this pop-up window is simply give us some options for the air handler that uh, we're going to be programming and I wanted to go over some of those in detail. If you have an air handler that is constant volume you would want to select this option here and what that is if you have a starter where it just pulls in a contactor from the controller and the air handler runs at constant speed. That is what you would want to select here. The variable speed is what we're going to be using. Uh, if uh, you have a variable frequency drive on your air handler, the variable speed, the static pressure control is what you would use. The system will use a static pressure set point to regulate the speed of the supply fan. And we're just going to leave that at default there. We do want fan status on this. We simply leave that checked. Uh, we also have additional options down through here as far as return fan. We're going to go ahead and add a return fan to this system. And the way that we want to set this up for the return fan is it's going to be variable speed also. And we want to have it to track the supply fan. Uh, you can use building static pressure uh, if you are, uh, if you have that type of a system, you know, that way you don't have doors standing open. Uh, if you have, you know, building pressure issues, if you overpressurize a building, some of the doors may stand, stand open. If you are running it negative, you may get into a situation where the doors could be hard to open. Uh, we're just going to leave that set to tracking the supply fan. You can also do volume matching, which if you are reading the airflow in your system, uh, your supply airflow, your outside air, how much outside air you're pulling in, that sort of thing, you would select this option. And we're just going to be using a single return fan. Uh, we will be using fan status. Again, this is just some of the basic things that we're going to go over. Uh, we're going to scroll on down here, of course, alarm management, lockout switch, that sort of thing, just depending on what you need for your particular system. You just go through here and answer the questions 
that it is asking you. And we simply scroll on down the economizers here. Uh, you know, there's some options here. Uh, of course, with the economizers, common, proportional, mixed air damper output, uh, then there's separate proportional. You know, if you needed additional uh, actuators, you needed different, additional types of control on those. Uh, return air damper and re the return air damper and outside air damper proportional. I mean, there's just a lot of options that they give you in here. And we will simply scroll on down. We outside air uh, here. You can see some of these options. I'm just reading them through as I'm going. Temperature control strategy, discharge air control, and we're going to get a little more into that in a future video. I'm going to actually show you how you can calculate your discharge air temperature based upon outside air temperature. We will do that in an additional video, like I said. And we will be using this as just as a default uh, setup for this particular air handler to show you how this is going to work. And here, of course, occupancy control, uh, scheduled occupancy, which is something that you can use in uh, different systems. Now, if you're using a makeup unit that runs all the time, you may just want to let it run. It just really depends on a lot of factors that play in to how your building is operated. We're going to leave preheat checked. We're just going to go through here some of these other points. We do have hot water or steam. Proportional output for the type of actuator you're going to be using. We have either a two-wire valve, face and bypass damper. There's a lot of options here. Some air handlers will have valves as well as a face and bypass damper. Of course, if you've been doing this long, you know that. And some air handlers will simply have everything in line to where you have the hot water coil prior to the chilled water coil. And when you do not need heat, the valve for the hot water coil is simply shut. And it's just very basic what we see here. We're just going to leave a lot of our standard options as we scroll on down, shutdown strategy. Uh, protect coil, that sort of thing. This is your safety. This is going to be your low outside air temperature, uh, leaving water control. You know, you want to make sure that you protect those chilled water coils. You need to uh, be sure that any kind of an issue with if your system gets too cold, cold that you shut it down. You, you know, you want to make sure that you just drop it off. If safety opens up, we usually will actually hardwire safeties into the start circuit with the VFDs. And uh, I have seen situations to where a safety would simply be a software input to a uh, controller. That's a bad thing to do. You want it to shut the unit down if it gets too cold. And this is some of the options if you were going to shut the system down for whatever reason. If uh, you know you did have a safety trip, you want to protect that coil. As you see this option here, uh, you, you just do not want to freeze and bust the coil. As we all know that. Loss of airflow strategy, again, protect the coil. Um, and unreliable sensor protect the coil if it can't see outside air temperature if it doesn't know exactly what it's doing those will open up the heating valve and try to keep that coil from freezing now here we have our options for cooling this is going to be a chilled water system you can do staged cooling uh, you have proportional incremental actuator, two position actuator, and there again, this is going to depend on the type of actuator that you are going to use in your particular system. And we will continue scrolling on down, and you can see here loss of airflow strategy again. Currently this is set to off. This is for the cooling side, which really if the air handler goes down generally depending on the way an air handler is configured i know a lot of the ones that we have with the hot water coil prior to the chilled water coil 
when something trips that air handler, the hot water coil will open up, the valve for it will open up, and inside those units will generally get very hot. Uh, they do this even in the summertime. So really for this particular application, we would not need to open the valve for a chilled water coil. However, there are some situations in larger air handlers, if your chill water coil is away from the hot water coil, this is something that you may want to do. That way, if you can maintain flow through that coil, say if the uh, if there's not a real big temperature rise from the location of the hot water coil to where the location of the chilled water coil is in the air handler, this may be an option for you. Or if it's an extreme cold situation, you may want to maintain flow. Generally, with the way things are here, with the way weather patterns are, we only have a couple of units where we do this. And it is simply because of the size of those units and the way that the coils are in those. Uh, you know, we try to maintain flow if the system trips for whatever reason and it's super cold outside. You know, just maintaining that flow will help. And again, this is on a unit that is uh, attached to a central chill water plant. Uh, systems that are generally attached to their own chiller, we will just drain them. And that way we don't have as much to worry about uh, on uh, freezing a coil. But again, that's going to depend on the way your system is configured. And again, we have other options here. Uh, reheat, if your system has a, some type of a reheat on it. I know there are um, heat recovery loops, that sort of thing that can be used for preheat, but then as far as reheat, if you're going to be using a system to where you have some type of a dehumidification, this would be an option that you would want to select. Now, if you are just feeding a series of VAVs, you're going to get some reheat from the VAVs themselves. However, depending on the building, depending on the application, you may need dehumidification. And that's where the reheat is going to come into play. And generally what you will do in a situation where you have reheat is the reheat coil will be after the chill water coil. And to pull as much moisture out of that air as possible, you will generally drive that chill water coil open to 100% and then temper that air with the reheat coil. And that's how a VAV system will generally do it. You know, we're discharging, say, a 55 degree discharge from an air handler, and you get to the VAV, and the VAV coil will reheat that air up if the room needs heating. And, you know, there's, so there's a lot of options. It would be extremely difficult to get into all of the different situations that could play into this. There are some buildings, just by their very nature, that you would need a reheat coil in addition to VAV reheat. Uh, you know, a very moist environment, uh, that sort of thing. Like some of the areas in uh, zoos, for example, Sometimes they'll have areas where a lot of reptiles are and there's a lot of humidity in there and they will need some type of a humid humidity control to maintain a specific humidity level for those animals. Other situations could be lab experiments, that sort of thing. So there's a lot that plays into this. So that is going to be a question that you will have to answer for your particular system. For this one, we're not going to use a reheat. We're just going to go with a standard single duct VAV system. So we uncheck that and you can see that it just grays out all of these options there. Now, of course, here is your dehumidification control sequence. If we were to select that, I'll just drop it down. We're gonna be, we would be reading zone humidity. And I will tell you a bad situation that I have seen some people try is they've come in and tried to add dehumidification control after the fact without having any type of reheat in the system. And I can tell you from personal experience, it does not work, okay? There's no way to put it. There's no way to sweet coat it, sugar coat it, or anything like that. If you want to have a good dehumidification control, you need to have coils after 
that chilled water coil to reheat that air. There is no way to ignore that fact. You're fighting the laws of physics. You're not going to get effective dehumidification in a system that does not have some type of a reheat system, either through the VAVs or through a reheat coil. Uh, generally, most buildings, the VAV reheat does a pretty good job of uh, maintaining the uh, humidity levels. However, some environments you may need an additional level of dehumidification beginning at the air handler. And, you know, the air handler would then still push air out to the VAVs and then the VAVs would do whatever they needed to. So that really depends on your area. Some areas are more humid than others. Uh, some particular buildings, uh, depending on how they're used, may need more humidity in them. They may not have a problem with them. They may need less. Uh, we have areas that we have humidifiers where we try to increase the humidity levels for those particular rooms and lab areas and that sort of thing. Now, once you go through and you have selected all of your options here you do have the uh, this option here for communication the into communicate compatibility options now one thing that is happening with a lot of the legacy controllers where they're getting harder to find people are replacing a lot of the legacy controllers with the newer generation of controllers the FECs or the FAC is one of the newest uh, which will fit directly onto the back panel of a DX9100. So this is something else that you may need, uh, but for this we would just set this up as if it was going to be a standard back net operation. And additional features here, smoke control, unit enable, enable switch, power fail, restart, that, that sort of thing. Just, uh, just whatever you need for your particular system. We simply press our next. Once we have selected all of that, we have here some additional questions as far as, uh, let's see, optional sensors, that sort of thing. If we wanted to, okay, modulated damper output, no position feedback. And there may be some situations where you need to know what the position of a particular damper is, uh, but we're gonna leave that off. You know, there can be some ways, like if you're going to have a system uh, for example, a makeup unit to where you have isolation dampers uh, on the end of the unit or, uh, uh, you know, on the supply side or on the intake side. For perfect example, on a makeup unit where you have a chill water coil and that sort of thing, it's very common to have a set of isolation dampers close if you get into an extremely cold situation. If the air outside is cold enough to freeze that coil you do not want to take the chance and bust the coil i mean that's all there is to it uh with the, if the preheat system is not able to get that air temperature up enough to a safe level before it goes into that unit uh, you would want to have a set of dampers to isolate it from the outside air now of course if you have those dampers closed you don't need to run the system, you know, and there's a lot of options that you can do there. You might have a way to have a minimum amount of damper, uh, just depending on what the system does. Most of ours, if the damper is closed, it's not going to run until that damper gets fully open. And that can be done with a binary input. You want to know that that damper is fully open. You have an end switch on that damper. Uh, you can use some actuators that have a set of contacts, position contacts directly on them. There's others that tell you the specific, the specific location and that sort of thing. Uh, generally what we will do, instead of going to an input on this, which is a, one option to do, we would also take that through a relay where you would not only make the input, but you would also have a set of contacts in series with the start circuit on the air handler. Don't always trust electronics to keep things safe. You know, use those hardwire relays, those hardwire circuits uh, when you can to help ensure that you save yourself a lot of trouble, a lot of aggravation, and keep a coil from busting. So that's some of the options there. And we will scroll on down. You can see here more feedback on valve positions, that sort of thing. Uh, if you wanted to get feedback from the drive, you could select that option here, whether it's motor speed, drive frequency, motor percent, 
depending on your network, depending on your VFD, you can feed that directly into your controller. Some VFDs will communicate through BACnet and or into or just whatever uh, type of communication you're using. And then you can just pull those points right into your system, right into Metasys to where you can see them if, if necessary. Uh, this being a system where it's just going to be static pressure control, we would not necessarily need to know what the motor speed is. Uh, we could look at the output, knowing what the uh, drive does. We could just look at what the output is doing and that sort of thing. But again, it really depends on how you're going to use your system. It really depends on how the unit is needing to be perf to, is needing to perform. Uh, what it's doing, type of application, and that sort of thing. Outside air, we are going to be measuring air temperature, and we will do that for a future video, and uh, you will see why when we get into that video. So be sure to subscribe and uh, follow the channel for all of the latest updates. Minimum outside air, sometimes there will be a set of dampers that or minimum outside air dampers basically the size of that damper is considered the minimum amount of air that should be brought into a building for co2 control we have units all over the place that do that one set of dampers will open fully and that damper will be the minimum outside air that is brought into the building others it's just a mixed air damper control and we will have just a minimum of uh, opening on that like 15 20 percent just depending on how much co2 is in the building when it's occupied that sort of thing there are times when we will use co2 control to where it would drive the outside air dampers open and bring in more fresh air uh, just depending on how that is needed and if some more options here we can uh, select we can select CO2 as far as reading what the discharge air is here. If we wanted to know how much CO2 is in that discharge air, we could select humidity, uh, temperature. There's just a lot of options. Uh, return air, if we wanted to read our return air temperature, we'll grab that. And relief air, uh, and just a lot of options. Zone, if we wanted to have a zone sensor, uh, humidity sensor, CO2 sensor, that sort of thing. That's where we would select that here. Now this can be done in several ways. You can have an option where you are taking an average reading of a lot of zone temperature sensors throughout the space, or you could have a temperature sensor directly tied to the air handler. So that would be an option that you may want to select there depending on what you're wanting to do. Again, building uh, static pressure, this is some additional inputs that you can put in the system for monitoring for various other purposes. We're just going to leave those blank. Pre-filter, filter switch, that sort of thing. Uh, if you wanted to monitor the uh, static drop across your filters to where, uh, you know, if the static pressure across those filters became so far out that it's obvious that they're dirty, you can have it flag an alarm and that sort of thing. And again, some monitored uh, safeties. This is our high static pressure switch. If you wanted to know that the safety had tripped, you can select this option here. And again, same for the return duct. And we do have systems where we do have both high pressure and low pressure safety switches. That way, if it trips, we know what the cause is. And then, you know, we have people in the buildings, we can just call them, you know, and let them know that it was either high pressure or low pressure, and they can go right to it, reset it, and get the unit back in operation much faster. Low temperature switch, low limit temperature switch, you know, if that coil, you know, that again, that's that coil safety. You want to protect that coil. I have seen high limit temperature switches put into some applications where I don't think they are necessary. However, there are some where you may want to consider that. Like if you're going to, uh, depending on your system, depending on the temperature control, if you don't want air that's so hot above a certain temperature, if you don't want it to, the unit to discharge that, uh, that is an option that you may select. Most of the time for the type of system we run, those just become a nuisance but it really depends on the application for your system. Like I say, there are times when they, that may be necessary to be used. 
Humidity alarm, same thing. If you don't want to have uh, the humidity to be above a certain level or below a certain level, that's gonna be something that you may select also. Once we have all of this, Okay, and the last option is fire dampers. If there are fire dampers in the system, which we do not use our system to control fire dampers in any way, those are independent. The way the fire system is set up in the buildings at our campus, uh, there is a uh, usually a connection between the fire dampers, the fire control system, and the air handler, which simply shuts the air handler off. And uh, that's it, you, you know, that way you do not pull fresh air into a fire and feed that fire. So we're just gonna leave that blank. Now, we have all of our options selected. We're simply gonna hit finish. And it is going to go ahead and populate a lot of the logic for us. It'll take it just a few minutes. As you can see, the system is spinning its wheels and it will populate the screen for us shortly. Yeah, this is in real time just to kind of give you an idea now different computers different processing power that sort of thing and here we are and another point about this also before i get into any of the settings in here another point also the way the system does if i click on my device hardware tab and then i go to the point assignments you can see here, this is going to be some of the thing places to where it thinks sensors need to be landed. But from this particular screen here, you, this is where you're going to select the type of controller that you need. Uh, it's going to default to what it thinks that you need, uh, but you can change that here. You would simply hit select and then choose the type of controller that you are going to be using. And something else I want you to notice on this, when I go to the point assignment, you will notice that there are two points here that do not have a home. And the reason for that, this particular controller is maxed out for the type of inputs or outputs that we need for these. So it, this is why you would need to go in here and either select a different controller or you would simply need to add an additional device such as an IOM. And this is where you would do that from. Uh, system requires two additional hardware inputs. So what I can do is simply hit add device and find an IOM that will meet what I need. You can see here we have universal inputs, uh, analog inputs, binary, universal outputs, and that sort of thing. And then go through here and then just select from this list what you need for your system. I'm just gonna grab one at random. I'm just gonna select that one, hit OK. It's gonna ask how many, I'm just gonna say one. And again, this is overkill for this particular thing. There was just two points. Now I can go back in here to my point assignment and you can see that it has populated those additional points over here for me. And as you can see, there's a lot of wasted points here. So you can go through and select the different type of controller and any additional features you need. However, if you're going to use this controller to do some additional things, you may want to use some of these additional points. It also gives you uh, a layout of where it thinks you need to put a particular points. When you go to wire your system, you can see here input one, uh, discharge air temp, input two, return air temp, and that sort of thing. So this is just some of the basic steps in programming an air handler. Uh, again, there is no way that I can get into all scenarios. This is just a brief overview of how to use CCT to set up the programming for an air handler. And uh, again, it's, uh, there, there are many options here. There's a lot of ways you can customize this. Guys, hope you liked the video. Leave any questions down in the comments below. I'll try to answer as many as I can. In fact, if I get enough of the same questions, I'll generally try to do a video focused on that particular topic. Also check out the links down below. I have got links to a lot of the tools that I use 
in my day-to-day -day servicing and that sort of thing, in my day-to-day -day operations and my day-to-day -day work. So check out those links in the description below. Be sure to subscribe. Check out the rest of the videos on the channel. Thanks for watching, guys, and we will see you next time.